Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very glad to be here uh, presenting today at the OpenEx conference right when it all started, almost 10 years ago. So, so thanks for joining me. Uh, as has been said, my name is Juan Montoya. I work with Edunext. We've been working with the past 10 years with the OpenEx platform. And today I'm going to be presenting this talk, Integrating OpenEx with more than 5,000 web applications for automated workflows. It was a very long title. Um, so there is a great, as you probably know, there is a great deal of applications online that we all use and love that serve multiple purposes. So that includes everything from your communication tools, your collaboration suites, marketing, lead automation, even your generative AI tools that are recently becoming very popular, um, reporting, data visualization, service desk tools, you name it. Um, and for the specific learning part, there are gamification tools, there are tools that issue credentials, many different applications that serve a specific purpose. So when you run up an online learning initiative powered by OpenEdX, you often want to integrate to some of those tools at some point. You wish you could integrate with one or, or more of those tools. And uh, because this is an open source platform, of course you can integrate. Most of those applications will provide you with a way uh, they will expose APIs, so they will provide any integration endpoints that you can consume. So there's always for you the possibility to go and build with the open source code, go and build your um, custom integration. There are many reasons why you will want to integrate. Here are some uh, examples. You want to streamline your operations. You want to synchronize data across multiple applications. Or you may, you may just want to automate processes, reduce at, at, the, at the minimum, the number of manual interventions that need to happen. Or you may need to uh, adapt to some specific business rules, just extend the capabilities of your platform. Or you may be looking after like the learning experience, make it the best experience for them to learn. Whatever the reasons are, and maybe others I haven't thought of, you can, also, uh, you can always, as I said before, build your custom integration. So the, the platform and the community have gone up long way, we've come a great length into, into creating these frameworks for integrations to be built. So there's plugins, there's X blocks, there is IDAs, independently deployed applications. Or you could even go all the way and fork the platform. Hopefully you don't need to, that's not ideal for, for the maintenance, like long-term maintenance point of view. But you could still work, fork the platform and, and make your changes and integrate, build your code to integrate with the application of your choice. But there is a cost that comes to that. You probably know this already. So you need to build that kind of integration. You need to invest energy in product design, then do the implementation, testing, documentation, all the build cycle. And then the hardest part, you need to maintain it over time. And this type of pieces of software that integrate two, two, two different platforms tend to be brittle and hard to maintain because whatever changes in any of both ends you need to adapt to. So you'll need to make changes every time OpenX platform changes or you need to make changes every time your external tool adapts or changes in some way. Uh, or your, your, your business needs may change as well. The reasons why you're doing the whole thing may change over time, may adapt, may evolve. So you'll need to prepare for a lot of maintenance, which involves technical expertise, time, budget. You can do it yourselves, of course. This is a knowledge community. And you can also hire some contractor to do it for you. Um, we're going to be talking about a an alternative, a proposed alternative to bridge this gap between the external applications and OpenEdX. So we're going to be using um, an alternative, an approach that involves two main components, one integrator, integration broker, and a set of OpenEdX adapters. That's what we're going to do to, to connect the 5,000 applications with OpenEdX. So let me break it down for you and, and explain each of these two components. So first there is the integration platform as a service, or IPAAS. Um, it's, it's basically a cloud service that it's a, it's a well-established model already. Uh, it's a cloud service that has already native integrations with a ton of applications, a large number of applications, and it makes it easy for you to, to connect the dots between those applications. Mm, there are many um, examples you could think of. So let's, let's say, for example, I want that whenever somebody fills in my HubSpot form in my CRM, they put in some information and submit. I want that information to be captured and posted in my project management tool, for example, Trello in this case. 
So uh, whenever I want to do that, the IP AAS com comes in handy. What it does is um, on, the, on the starting end on the, of the workflow, it listens to platform A, let's say HubSpot in this case. It listens to, to the platform A. Basically, it polls it frequently to see what's coming. And it's, it's, it's listening for a triggering event. And whenever that triggering event happens, the IP AAS captures the payload, captures some data out of that event. And then on the other end, it authenticates into platform B, let's call it, and launches an action so that whatever I want to happen, happens, right? That's what the, that's what the IPAS um, model is all about. Sapir is the one we're going to be showing today. It's one of those platforms, definitely not the other one. It's a well-established solution, sapir.com, uh, but there are certainly others. Uh, I have here a few logos for you to check. Active Pieces is interesting because it's open source. It's the only one I've found to be open source. The other ones are just commercial products. And we're not particularly invested in Zapier. We don't, we're not endorsed in any way. We just use it, have used it for a while, and, and find value in, in, in the way it works and, and, and what it does. But the truth is there is a little bit of um, platform effect because you want your IPAAS platform to be integrated with as many applications as possible. And Sapir is definitely the giant here. It's integrated with exactly 5,000 potential applications, whereas the others, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000, the next one that I have found. So it's by far the, the most um, well-positioned, if you will. But you could, again, apply many or most of what we've been, we're going to be discussing today to any of the other providers. So taking Sapir as an example, it is a quite simple process. We're going to take the example of the HubSpot thing triggering a, a, a publication in the Trello card. It's basically a four-step um, procedure. You just first create a SAP. It's called a SAP, this, this, this little automation that's going to be running for you. You create it and give it a name, uh, and then you need to set up your trigger. So the, the, the blue box, the second step is setting up your trigger. It's uh, very simple. I'm going to show it and not to, not to take too long. Uh, but it's basically select HubSpot as your application then connect to HubSpot, providing your credentials and authorization so that Zapier and HubSpot talk to each other. Then you select the event out of the possible events that HubSpot is able to raise, a ton of them. Uh, I want to select the event that's called a form was filled. I don't recall the name exactly, but a, a web form has been filled. And then I select the ID of the particular form that I want. And that's all I have to do. I can test it directly from Zapier, which is going to be polling HubSpot to see if what was the latest submission of that particular form and collect the data. And when I test it, I get to see the payload, I get to see the data that the form is collected so I know, and I have wildcards for, for using, referencing that information in my, in my next step. That's setting up the trigger. Then the third step is setting up the action. So now we go to the Trello side of things, select Trello as the application, connect with my Trello account, again, username, password, authorization, and then I select the possible actions that Trello can perform. One of them is publish something in a card, I select the specific card I want to publish, and then I configure the content of the publication. So what do I want to be written in that card? Um, I, I can just type whatever message I want, but I can use wildcards that will reference the information I collected from step two. So the person filled in your, their name, their email, whatever, I can use wildcards to use, include that into the text that I'm going to be publishing in Trello. Again, I test it, so actually that publishes in the Trello card, and I can verify that it works correctly. Whenever it, Whenever uh, everything is nice and, and, and working, I can go to the fourth step, which is just publishing my SAP, and that means it's running, it's polling, uh, and the automation that we want is happening. That's a very simple example of what you would do with SAP. You're just connecting to, to applications point to point. Mm, but it has advanced tools, advanced tools. You can do more, more than that, uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit more. On the set up the trigger side, uh, Sapir has some advanced tools that allow you, for example, not to have an application on that end, but instead having a scheduler. So you want something to happen every day, every week, every hour, it will just does that for you, schedules the, the, the triggering of the, work, or the, of the workflow. It also has an email parser, so you can just have the workflow be initiated by an email that comes in. So Sapir takes the email, parses it, gets the information, and starts the workflow from there. Or it has, and this is important for the rest of our talk, the capability of exposing a webhook. So you can just expose a webhook that will be there to, to be called upon by some external application, right? Mm, that's for the trigger, setting up the trigger section. And for the, for the uh, setting up the action part, 
the advanced tools include things like multi-step action. So you have to collect a signal and do one thing. You can collect a signal and do multiple things. And, and it becomes complicated. It has some, some tools that will allow you to build really more complex uh, workflows with delays. If you don't want the action to happen right now, but maybe one week from now or a few hours from now or whatever. It has uh, kind of if-then statements, not exactly called uh, like that, but something that allows you to branch out and take different actions depending on conditions. It has loops, it has storage. So it has the tools that will allow you to build your own little um, workflow there. And then it also has actions, built-in actions, so that you don't need to like, connect to another platform for doing simple things like sending an email. If you just want to collect the signal from HubSpot and then notify somebody over email about something, Zapier will do that for you. Send the email, send an SMS message, or publish some syndication, if, if, if that's what you want. So with those advanced tools, um, in general, Zapier has significant advantages. The number of applications I mentioned is quite large. The, in the interface is intuitive, it's easy to use. All these built-in tools are, are useful, so you can have a lot of flexibility and build quite complex workflows over time. And it's free to start, or it's advertised to be free to start, but not really, because the advanced tools are needed for what we're going to be showing, and that requires a paid subscription. But it's not a huge cost at the beginning. It's a, it's a, it's a very affordable thing, so, so it's definitely worth checking out. Checking out. Mm. And it has auditing capabilities, so every time something goes wrong with one of your endpoints, you get notifications and you see error logs and audit logs, so you can really understand what's going on if you need to change or adapt, adapt something. And finally, last but not least, importantly, it has uh, powerful developer tools to, to help you or anyone, any like developer, build a nat native integration with, with an application. That's probably one of the reasons why it has so many integrations, because it's relatively easy for a programmer to build an integration, a native integration against Zapier for a particular tool. <coughs> so that was the first component, the integration broker. Remember, there's a second component we need to discuss, which is the OpenEx adapter. So because OpenEx wasn't necessarily built for this kind of integration, or well, yet, as of yet, <laughs> we need to put in place the adapters, which is a piece that is going to interface between the IPAAS and the, and the OpenAX platform. So in order to explain these, these adapters in more detail, I need to explain two different possible workflows, right? So there is the inbound workflow, where the signal happens in the external application, and you want something to happen in OpenAX, or the outbound workflow. Something happens in OpenAX, therefore I want something to happen in, you name it, in OpenAI, right? So uh, for the inbound workflow, some examples here just to entice your brains, but I'm sure you could think of, if you think your specific uh, use cases, the way you use the OpenX platform in your organizations, I'm, I'm sure very interesting things will come up. But just to give you some ideas, uh, whenever somebody registers in my CRM Salesforce form, I want the user account to be automatically created in OpenX for that person. Or whenever a request is marked and appro as approved, sorry, in Notion, let's say I use Notion, I want course creation permissions to be granted to that user because he was approved. I want them to have course creation permissions in OpenAX. Or whenever somebody made a purchase in PayPal, I want the enrollment to happen in OpenAX, so a mini e-commerce solution here. They paid in PayPal, so I want them to be enrolled in the course. Mm, or finally, whenever the user submits a ticket, a support ticket using Sendest, my support application of choice, they get unenrolled from the course, for example. Those are just a few examples of the inbound workflow. And what the adapter will be doing here is basically building an HTTP request against some administrative APIs, right? So we need to have an administrative API, an API endpoint that can be called over HTTPS or HTTP request uh, for, for the things uh, in OpenAX to happen. So why don't we use the the standard OpenAX APIs, I hear you ask, basically because they're not built for administrative purposes. They are built for the, the, the authenticated user to affect their own records. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them will only allow me as an authenticated user to change my own enrollments. But here we're working at the administrative level. We want to be able to enroll anybody in any course, even create new users or whatnot. So we need a new set of APIs entering EOX core. EOX 
It stands for Edunix Open Extension. So there's a whole set of plugins that Edunix have developed over the years that are open source, available in our GitHub page. This one is AUX Core. It's a very stable, already in an eighth release. And it basically exposes these administrative APIs for the most uh, common data objects that you want to, to intervene. So users, you can create users or get users' information. Enrollment, you can create enrollment, change enrollments, delete enrollments, uh, or grades. You can read the grades. At this point, it does basically those things. We're growing on, on, on the number of ideas and, and uh, possibilities we can do here. So if you have any, any, any contributions to that, uh, feel free to talk to us about that. But there is already the Elfscore uh, main package, which does these ones, and it's available for anyone to use, install as a plugin. So let's very quickly run through an example of how an inbound workflow would, 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 like, would look like. Uh, this is probably the most technical part, so not to worry about that. Um, so again, there's a four-step procedure in SAP here. Just create this app. Then setting up the trigger will be similar to what we did with HubSpot and Trello. Very easy. Click through it. So select PayPal. Give your credentials to authorize PayPal to talk to Zapier. And then select the event. A successful sell has happened. Like, sell was successful. Then you need to, or say, uh, PayPal will provide for you a webhook. Sorry, Zapier will provide for you a webhook URL that you need to copy and paste into PayPal. PayPal has this thing that's called IPN, Instant Payment Notification. So whatever a payment happens, PayPal does whatever the IPN tells, the, tells it it has, to, it has to do. So in this case, we're going to tell it to let Zapier know that the payment was successful. And now you can test it. So basically, you can make a purchase. Pay, have somebody pay in PayPal and make sure that Zapier got the information. You verify the payload went correctly, and you, you got the information about the payment. Uh, so that test is successful. You can go to the third step. Third step is important. Here's where the OpenEdX stuff is going to happen. So let's zoom in a little bit in this green box. So we're going to be selecting as application one of the advanced tools by Zapier that's called Webhooks by Zapier, right? And uh, out of that, the, the event will be called custom request, or the, not really the event. The type of action will be called custom request because that allows you to build your HTTP request however you want it. Uh, and then in the next step, my, my box here on the right, you can define the type of method. In this case, it's a post. You paste the URL of your API endpoint, and then you write the payload, like the data payload that that HTTP request is going to have. Uh, in this case, it's very simple. I just need, because I'm doing an enrollment, because they purchased the course in PayPal, so I want them to be enrolled. I just need the email, which I get out of a, out of a wildcard that comes from step two. And then I need the course ID. Let's say it's only one course, so just I have the fixed course ID, uh, course mode, and a couple of more uh, small parameters there. And then I provide authorization tokens, so headers that have my, my bearer token. Authorization can be much more complex than this, but I just made the simplest case. I have the token already, so I provide it with the HTTP request. Uh, I test it, and if everything goes correctly, my um, um, enrollment will, will be coming up on the OpenAI side. So I can publish. That's the inbound workflow exemplified in detail. Now let's see the outbound workflow. So think about it. What could we do? If, what could you do if you had this kind of capability? I have some examples here. One of them is, and you need to read this from right to left. Whenever a learner registers to the OpenX platform, I want to have an email sent, a welcome email sent. Whenever somebody enrolls in the course. I want to have them invited into a particular Slack channel because maybe we're using Slack in the course and I want that everybody joins the, the Slack channel. Whenever a learner gets a certificate, I want to issue the badge incredibly in something else, badger or not. So those are just examples of outbound workflow. And the adapter here, let's talk about the adapter. What do we need to, 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 to make the bridge between OpenAX and, and the IPAAs? We need a signal to be raised at the, on the OpenAX side of things. And we need somebody that catches that signal, packs the payload, and sends it over to Zapier, right? So for the signal, thankfully, we have that already. We have OpenAS hooks. You probably know about that. It's been, out, it's been out for like two years already, documented in OEP 50. So there is filters and events. Some of you may have gone to Felipe's talk um, yesterday about how to program a new filter, a new event. Uh, so there is that. There's an important number of, of signals 
that are already raised by the platform, the master code of the platform in terms of, in, in, in the form of events. Uh, so what we're going to do with, with our adapter is catching that signal, packing the payload. What we do for that is EOX hooks. So it's again, a plugin open source by Edunex in its fourth release already. And it, and it catches already, we've been evolving and, 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 and increasing the number of, of um, signals this, this one catches. And for the time being, it has these uh, six, eight or something, 10 signals. Um, so but it's the most common things like post enrollment, after an enrollment happened, post registration, post on enrollment, uh, post changes in the cohort, post certificate creation, post login even. So whenever those signals happen, this, this plugin will cache them and allow you to, to do uh, the workflow with them. Let's go through the example really quickly. So we're going to take the example of whenever uh, somebody enrolls in my course, I want them to be invited to this Slack channel. So create a sub, really easy. Now the important part happens in the set up the trigger part, because this is the part that OpenEx is involved in. So let's zoom in here, setting up the trigger. I'm going to be using Zapier to select, again, web, web hooks by Zapier. But in this case, uh, the event uh, I select is catch hook and Zapier will produce a hook, web hook URL for me. And then I copy that and paste it into the OpenEx site, similar to what we did with PayPal. Uh, I paste that uh, web hook URL into the OpenEx site. Where exactly? In the LMS env YAML file, uh, the EOX hook plugin will give you this template for, for the hook definition. Basically, this says that at the post enrollment event, I need to take the action of posting to a web hook URL, and then I, uh, specify the parameters I want to send as the, as the payload. In this case, just the course ID, the learner email, and the learner name, just to give an example. And I give it the webhook URL, the URL that it's going to be calling. So whatever URL Sapir gave me, right? Sapir is going to be listening to that URL. And then a couple more parameters, and I'm done with that. Of course, this requires redeployment, so you deploy your application, restart your service, and uh, you can test it now, basically by uh, enrolling somebody in a course. And then you can go to step three in Zapier. So same as we did before, connect to Slack, give it your parameters, uh, your, your credentials, select the channel you want to, sorry, select the um, action, invite somebody to a channel, and then select the channel you want to invite them in, and then uh, give them the user that needs to be invited by using the wildcards that you got from step two. Since you tested it, you have the wildcards already, so you put them here to tell um, Slack that they need to invite that particular user. If you test it and everything is okay, you can publish, and now you have your automation running. Excellent, so um, before we wrap it up, there is one more thing we can, we can talk about, which is why is not OpenAX in the list of 5,000 applications, or what would it take for OpenAX to be in the list of the 5,000 applications? So that's what I'm calling a native OpenAX integration for Zapier. One thing we do have already is the tools to build it. So Zapier, uh, as I mentioned in the, at the beginning, Zapier has some, uh, either a UI interface for building integrations, and also a Zapier, um, something that's called Zapier Platform CLI, which is a way for you to code, I think it's in JavaScript, the, the specific integration you want. And what advantage you will get out of a native integration that you don't have to deal with the hooks uh, thing. You just select OpenEx out of the, out of the possible um, applications to integrate with, run the authentication part, so provide some credentials, probably using the Django Auth uh, toolkit, and then uh, just Zapier ideally will just show you the events that OpenEx can raise and then show you the actions that OpenEx can perform. And for each of those, we'll display a nice interface that catches the parameters and validates the business rules so that you don't put a parameter that is not valid, things like that. So we're not there yet. There isn't a native OpenEx integration for Zapier that we know of. But uh, there's definitely a lot of interest. We're working towards building them. Uh, building it, there is uh, very talented people in, in our team I want to make the shout out to uh, that built an initial prototype. Perhaps not, it was, wasn't perhaps fully ready to be shown here, but it's already a working prototype that we have been using with, with some initiatives. And um, whenever 
there is interest, and if somebody, some of you are interested in that, in, in, in uh, exploring that path, we'll be happy to talk to you. Excellent, so that's it. Thank you very much. Any, if there's any questions or comments, I'll be glad to take them. I think we're right on time. I'm just gonna pass the mic around because we're recording this, so though we can all hear it, let's at least do this. Hi, my name is Tom. I know that you're a, a vendor to this community in EduNext. Sure. What was not clear to me from your presentation is the plugin component for uh, Open edX to allow it to connect to edX. Is that something that's currently available? Is it free? Is it something you're selling? What's going on there? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, I probably skipped through it quite fast, but there's actually two different adapters, so two different plugins, one for the inbound workflow and one for the outbound workflow. Both of them are open source, meaning that they are available for anyone that uses OpenAX to use. They just need to like fork them and, uh, sorry, um, clone them and install them in your own platform. So the adapters are ready. Yeah, sure, in our Linux account. Excellent. Um, thanks for the presentation, Juan. Sure. I think you delivered on the 5,000, so <laughs> good job. Um, uh, also a question about the inbound and outbound plugins. First, uh, EOX Core. So you said that it kind of lets you work with more of those API commands, so you can kind of have you know, an administrator uh, operate those for users. Um, is it all the API commands that are listed in that big API document? Is it some? Where is that documented? Yeah, that document uh, is gets to be deployed in Swagger as part of the installation of the plugin. So okay. as long as you install the plugin, you'll get the documentation. Yeah. The ones I mentioned before, let me go quickly down there to see it, um, are the most important ones and the ones we use more often. But my understanding is that we, th we do have some more endpoints. We have, for example, one that deals with the cohorts assignment yeah. as well. But I mentioned this because they are the three more useful ones, like users, enrollments, and grades. I think we do have, as part of the EOX core package, some other endpoints that can be can be utilized. Okay, well. got it. Yeah, these are the six, the seven though that are like yeah, the, yeah, exactly. The you core. get the Swagger documentation with the with the examples and the interactive cool uh, okay. way of testing. And then for the EOX hooks, I have not used um, edX events. I think that's the name of it. Yep, I haven't used edX events, um, but I thought that that did what I saw EOX hooks. Doing. So can you describe the difference between edX events and EOX hooks sure. or how they're used? Sure. So I'm sure you could modify the existing events and filters to do something like that. And I think Felipe in the in the workshop yesterday did an example of that. Let's have our our event call a Zapier endpoint, right? But probably it's too deep into the code for be flexible and configurable by, by, a, by an administrator. So one of the things this additional layer does is it allows you to have it configured to, to, to configure it more, more, more easily. And importantly, it packages the, uh, the, 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 the payload depending on what you need specifically because it may be the case that the signal is raised but it doesn't have all the information that, it, that you need to pass along to the external application. So on top of the signal, you need to go and pack the payload. For example, an enrollment happened but you don't, got the, you don't have the name of the person. You just have the user ID. So you need to pack your, in, in this uh, plugin, you will pack your payload with the username so that you can send an email, like calling them by their name, for example. So things like that. Cool. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, anyone else questions? Tom again, uh, scalability. What sort of volume of traffic have you been driving through this plugin? How many records per hour? Some of those kinds of questions. Right, that's a good question. And one of the criticisms that can be made probably for, for, for Zapier, it does support a large scale, but cost increases uh, uh, yeah. significantly. So in our projects, previous projects with customers, we've never taken them uh, to, to huge scales, but we've seen things like tens of thousands of requests per month, which is something that, yeah, per month, which is not, I mean, it's not massive. 
So performance has never been an issue just because only tens of thousands of requests is, is not that much. But Zapier definitely will be able to handle uh, a lot more. The other criticism that, that I mentioned that, that, that word is uh, the, the polling frequency. Maybe if you want real time responses, you need the polling frequency to be very fast and that costs a little bit more. In, so, so cost adds up when you want super fast performance and a lot of volume. So you're talking about three or 400 a day, maybe a thousand. Yeah, they're not necessarily spread uh, evenly, but monthly numbers would be in tens of thousands that we have experienced. But that's 10,000 10, less manual interventions you need to do. <laughs> so, so it may pay off. I mean, even if the cost is at some point important, it may, it may be efficient. Anyone else? Any other questions? Hopefully it's because it was very clear. But in case it wasn't and you want to discuss it privately, we're staying at the booth uh, at the entrance. And yeah, happy to talk, uh, continue talking about this with anyone that's interested. Thank you.